Uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, briefly about uh, from basic to uh, biotech business, uh, path to clinic. So, but I want you to understand, I have not, uh, none of our products have reached the clinic yet, but we have made uh, several attempts, we are very close to it, but there are still some hurdles. You'll see as you go along uh, what the hurdles are and things like that. So since you are familiar with some of these aspects, for example, uh, for drug discovery and development pipeline, you start uh, first with the target uh, discovery. This is depending on the uh, disease you are interested in. You want to identify the receptor ion channel or an enzyme which is relevant for it so that you learn that if you block this receptor or ion channel, I can cure this problem. Okay? So you identify the target receptor or the ion channel. So for that, you start looking at the expression analysis and you look at the in vitro function of this molecule and uh, you also look at uh, in vivo validation. Uh, for example, you can look at how uh, it affects and there are a lot of ways of uh, validating this by doing knockouts or knockdown kind of studies. And once you are certain, you look at the bioinformatics, looking at the other animals, animal kingdom and to make sure that it indeed is truly responsible for the biology you are uh, after, the disease you are after. Once you identify the target, you go into discovery phase and screening phase. So here you are looking for the ligand, whether you want an agonist or an antagonist. So you start looking for those and this is done by, discovery is done through tra traditional methods of uh, screening one thing at a time are using combinatorial chemistry and you also use structure based design and I'm going to talk a little bit about these things and I'll also talk to you a little bit briefly about uh, in vitro screening and uh, ex vivo and in vivo but uh, some of these are really truncated versions of it for details you really have to go and study uh, elsewhere. Once you I discover and screen everything so you do the lead optimization, you have the ligand in your hand, so you start improving its ability to bind to the selected receptor or the ion channel and then start making sure that it does not interact with closely related ion channel or the receptor. Okay? And uh, this lead optimization has both traditional medicinal chemistry approach as well as rational design approach. So I'm going to touch a little bit about these subjects and then it is all this process, uh, admit, uh, development and registration, these are all very formal uh, studies. So the admit is uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion and toxicology. So that's the uh, word admit stands for. And this is done by a CRO. CRO is clinic, uh, contract, uh, clinical research organization where you contract out the research and they'll do all the uh, studies in the FDA approved or uh, you know, EPA approved or any of these big uh, medical agencies or health agencies approved uh, machinery. And then you go into phase one, phase two, phase three studies and then you apply for the uh, clearance from the FDA or uh, EMEA in Europe and in Japan it's uh, MHLW and of course the rest of the world has different names. For example, in Singapore we have HSA. So like that every country has its own drug authority which is going to allow the drug to be used in, the, in its population or not. Okay? So all of these have various time periods you need, required. This is an average how much time uh, you take. But I want you to remember only less than 10% makes it all the way here. But at every stage there is a lot of uh, uh, difficulties, not in terms of doing things, but there are failures uh, uh, to reach the final goal. Okay? And patent lifespan is 20 years, 
therefore time from discovery to market is very critical okay so with this kind of understanding let's have a look at uh, screening screening of course for small molecules or large molecules are different the price and things but uh, you can screen them with very low uh, throughput that means every day you can do probably 10 samples 20 samples okay with this rate you'll not be able to make a very significant progress unless it's your you know where the source is and you know exactly what you are looking for more clarity you have and uh, less competition outside you have you can deal with it even if it is low throughput okay but uh, high throughput is uh, is a fashionable thing and you can do a lot of these now we are talking about thousands of sample few thousand to ten thousand hundred thousand molecules you are looking for so you're looking at millions of molecules to identify the ligand which is uh, important to solve your problem whatever that this is your targeting okay so this is done in many 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 types of studies of course you can do it in uh, micro well titer things so you look at all of these and sorry you, you can find this uh, you know, this one is more active that one is not and like that you can easily pick them and start uh, moving to the next stages so this is just for screening and you can also do virtual screening this is also very fashionable because it's very colorful very easy to do and people do a lot of these things but uh, i just want you to uh, want you to really understand when you screen say 1000 100000 compounds by this virtual screening imagine you list top 100 your chance of hitting is still about 20% or below in spite of your uh, ligand based whatever screen docking and they don't necessarily mean that will give you a big hit only thing it does is it makes you think you have been successful in identifying one of the hits so if you screen same 100000 by in reality you probably will get about 20 25% hit and the number is much bigger than that okay so basically it's a technique everybody is happy with and of course it employs quite a number of people which is very good so people do use it quite often so for that we either take the receptor structure or the ligand structure from the database or by molecular modeling so molecular modeling has its own limitations that's the reason why there are problems with this docking and things like that so if you are interested i can go uh, elaborate a lot more on it but basically you take the ligand and the receptor and do the docking and the ligand would go and bind there and you think that's a very good hit and when it has very good affinity in terms of energy difference and things so you think this is a very good molecule to take it further so for example when you do this kind of virtual screening you get lots of different molecules okay lots of different molecules and you can dock them in and they would all fit in into the binding pocket and you think that's the key binding pocket and uh, you have all these kind of uh, put in in the right place and you think it's the best uh, fitting molecule and from there either you purchase these 10 or 15 compounds or 100 compounds and test them for their activity okay the second uh, way of doing this is you have a library and you this entire library you screen it for the target so that's the target molecule target receptor and you can do this by screening all of these molecules and identify this particular one is the target okay so that's the ligand but now there are people have started learning doing a second method it's called fragment based drug design so in fragment based the drug design instead of taking entire molecule they take various fragment libraries these have 
lot of opportunity for them to bind. So what they do is they take the drug target molecule, they do the crystal structure of this molecule. Okay? And this drug molecule is crystallized already. So all they do is soaking experiment. Soaking experiment is take the crystal, drop the thing in a solution which contains the mixture and pull it out in a few, a few minutes and uh, do the uh, structure and you identify there are three molecules which are bound to these things. So now when a single uh, individual molecules bind, their affinities are in millimolar concentration. Okay? But now if I connect it somehow by chemistry, the affinity goes very high. Imagine I hold this table in one hand, okay? It's not so strong. But if I hold it in two hands, it's a lot more stronger. So that's the affinity, okay? As you increase more and more hands, as you have seen in the picture, there are three of them, so you'll end up with nanomolar or sub-nanomolar affinity, okay? By combining. What they do now is, it is actually very hard to connect like this, but rather what they do is they grow. They see this part is bound there, the triangle one. So they grow on either side, the molecule, and to every step they see how the affinity is increasing and they connect it to the next one. And they try to insert the next part of it. So they grow the molecule uh, so that, so grow is not, it's by chemistry they, they're growing, they're attaching things to make it, okay? So when you do all these kind of studies, you have a ligand and you want to understand the structure activity relationship. This is called QSR, our quantitative structure activity relationship. For example, you take this part and change it with many different substitutions. And similarly, you take this part and you take this part. Different parts of the molecule, you keep changing the chemistry of it the structure of it, the length of the carbon chain, or the uh, uh, aromatic ring to aliphatic uh, side chain, and things like that. You modify many, many things and evaluate all these molecules for biological activity. That will start to give you a structure activity relationship, and you pick the best there is to do this study. So, even when the structures are very different, you also can do this uh, uh, QSAR. So in there, you start understanding, oh, I need this part, I need this part, I need this part kind of things. Say, for example, this is called comparative molecular field analysis or COMFA, where you put all these molecules together and start analyzing the data, then you start understanding oh, I need a hydroxyl group here, I need a hydrophobic group there, and I need an aromatic residue there, and things like that. This becomes very clear. So this is called pharmacophore identification. So you first identify exactly the static position. So this kind of flickers for some reason. Uh, it's dying or whatever. <laughs> so right there, and you can see there are a lot of other segments which are very important for binding. For, uh, for example, you have a hydrophobic segment and you have an aromatic uh, region. This is a hydro hydrogen bond donor in the red circle here. So like that, you see there are many of these selected groups that fit in there. Without those kind of geometry between the pharmacophores, you don't get biological activity, or at least very potent biological activity. So with this idea in mind, you can identify the pharmacophores. Once you identify the pharmacophores, like this, you have a hydrophobic region, and you have a hydrophobic, this is hydrophobic but with fluorides, so it's also extremely hydrophobic. And this is hydrophobic with the ring, and this is with the aromatic ring, and you have a positive ionizable charge. So like that, you start looking at the selective pharmacophore rather than the actual chemistry behind these things. For example, once you complete all of this, you would have a lot of these areas identified 
and you know the distances between these uh, groups. So using this, you can do search in a chemical database and you can identify molecules which would kind of more or less fall into this category. So some of these chemicals are easily available. So you pick these molecules and bring them back into the lab and start testing these. Okay? So this is one way of approaching studies. Okay? As I told you, I'm not a guy who starts with small molecule. I, I'm a person who works with larger peptides and proteins. So I'm going to move away from this and start telling you a little bit more. And just to give you an idea, we have uh, at this point, we have completed early stage uh, research and discovery. We are just entering into preclinical studies and animal models. So we, are, uh, we have completed animal model studies, but the toxicology studies have not been completed. So once we complete, we are getting ready to do phase one study with 20 to 80 uh, uh, healthy volunteers. And uh, this is for safety. And phase two is for efficacy and safety. And where you have about 100 to 300 patients. And then subsequently we move into phase three studies for efficacy and safety with larger group of patients. But this depends on the area. The area which I'm going to talk to you today uh, it's going to be probably few uh, 10,000, 5,000 to 10,000 patients we need to go through to get the clearance from there. And then it will be uh, submitted to FDA, our uh, equivalent uh, office, to look through the data and uh, uh, allow us the, to go into the market. Okay? So then, of course, even post-approval, there is still follow-up of the patients so that you understand how it, uh, generally, uh, how the general population or general, uh, patients in general population react to a certain drug. Okay? So this story I'm going to talk to you is development of injectable direct thrombin inhibitor. So let's see why it's important. Okay? So you are familiar with uh, percutaneous coronary intervention. So our PCI, this is the most common, it's called as uh, balloon angioplasty. Uh, it's a most common effective procedure for reducing mortality in uh, patients with acute uh, myocardial infarction are commonly known as heart attack, okay? And uh, what the clinician does is he uses a catheter to place a stent to open up blood vessels in the heart okay, that have been narrowed by atherosclerosis. So there is a plaque form, so you have a very small narrow uh, tube, so that means it takes, uh, it, uh, it's great difficulty in uh, passing the blood through. And if it is in just one or two tubes, uh, 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 blood vessels supplying the heart, we use uh, PCI. If there are more than two, three of them, Generally, they do open heart surgery. Okay, just to give you an idea, open heart surgery they have to cut open and put everything. So this is very risky. Okay, with the PCI coming in, you don't need such a drastic measure. All they do is just open up a small hole in the femoral artery and push the uh, catheter all the way to the heart and they can locate where they need to uh, open up this passage, okay? Once they open up the passage, it's, uh, the uh, heart starts functioning quite well and you have a very good flow to the heart muscles. Annually, there are over 2 million PCI surgeries throughout the world and this number will keep increasing because, as you know, uh, with our li lifestyle and things, our uh, uh, you know, uh, general population is getting older and older uh, as we go along. But there are still some countries, they have still younger population, but that's a good thing. So, but this number is going to go up. Currently, uh, I want you to understand, when you are doing PCI, the, you are going to insert a stent, okay? 
Stent is a foreign material. So it causes thrombosis. So it's pro-thrombotic. So that means it encourages clot formation. Okay? And the second thing is when you insert and push the balloon, what happens is you are creating a pressure on the plot, so plot is going to burst. So that induces uh, thrombosis or uh, blood clot. And when you are pushing it hard against the wall, you are also seeing the, it will damage the blood vessel, it will injure the blood vessel. So all this is going to lead to thrombosis or clot in the stent. If this happens, you are trying to make an opening, but it ends up with being completely blocked. You have 10% flow, now you have 0% flow. So patient will die. So that's the reason you need to use extremely potent antiplatelet drug and anticoagulant drug. Today I'm going to talk to you about anticoagulant drugs. Okay? So there are two, oh sorry, there are two drug molecules which are used. Most common one is unfractionated heparin. So this is uh, isolated, extracted from uh, pig intestine, but in some of the countries they also use bovine lung to make this uh, drug molecule, heparin. And this has problem because it's just extracted from the animal and it has unpredictable PK because it is not a pure compound, okay? And it also binds to various uh, parts of the plasma and endothelial cells and everywhere else. And it depends on one individual to the other individual. And because it comes from different sources of the animal, in a batch to batch variation is there and also it's not a pure compound mix the uh, pk is pharmacokinetics it varies quite significantly this you can also see in the animals okay and then there's a major problem of heparin induced thrombocytopenia fortunately it's not very big it's only anywhere between 0.5% to 5% of population and when you have this HIT, uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, 60% of the patients definitely die. There is no, no way of saving them. There is, we don't understand exactly what happens. 60% of them are gone. Only fortunate thing about it is it affects Westerners, but not the Asians. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, kind of weird, but it happens. We don't know exactly what the problem is. Okay, the people have not identified the biomarkers for it. There is no diagnostic way of finding it. So because of this problem, especially in North America and Europe, where uh, Westerners live most of the time, so, because they are in the West, <laughs> so. They want to avoid using uh, uh, heparin. Instead, the, there was a new drug which came about 20 years ago in the market. It's called Hirulog or Bivaluridin. This is designed based on hiridin, which is a leech uh, thrombin inhibitor. The only trouble we found out very recently in 2014, end of 2014, 2015, is that it has very poor efficacy. It causes bleeding, but they didn't check it that well. What happened in the uh, uh, clinical uh, studies is when they compared heparin with uh, hirulog, what they did was in the heparin arm, they had the antiplatelet drug. So antiplatelet causes bleeding, of course, if you go uh, in higher amounts. and in the arm where they did the Hirulag studies, they did not have the antiplatelet drug. So it appeared as if it does not cause so much bleeding. So now they have compared them with the same kind of controls. They have found out that it's not, not at all that great. Okay? 
and people in the in in between they developed ergotroban which is a direct thrombin inhibitor which uh, which is used to actually block heparin induced thrombocytopenia with heparin there is also another issue it requires anti thrombin 3 for inhibition it's a non specific inhibitor of thrombin it inhibits la 10a 12a and many other things as well it has a it requires anti thrombin 3 okay if a patient has anti thrombin deficiency or there is some uh, mutation in this molecule it doesn't work heparin does not work that's also a, luckily a small portion of uh, patients so it's only about 1 to 2% of the population which is not a big deal but i want you to understand although it is not a big deal when uh, 93 90 95% of people come out well but as long as your parent or your uncle is not in that 5% you are happy but <laughs> you know but that means we have to make sure we reach as close to 100% as possible okay because if it is you are relative in that uh, small percentage it hurts you anyway 93% may be happy but <laughs> so that's the problem and ergotroban has problem of bleeding and there is a stomach upset issue with it okay so that this tells you this background tells you that invariably we need new better molecules so we said let we let's have a look at making something out of uh, uh blood feeding animals so blood feeding animals they have either single or multiple host so single host is one species or multiple species uh they have to overcome a number of host responses so their saliva contains uh, vasodilators anticoagulants antiplatelet agent and immune suppressors okay so today we are interested in anticoagulants so if you look uh, uh, sorry uh, hematophagous animals you are familiar with most of these these are ticks bed bugs uh, flies this is a blood sucking fly this is another tick this is leech this is hookworm and this is a vampire bat okay but uh, today i'm going to focus only on hematophagous uh, phagous arthropods and uh, these are uh, one of the most successful group arthropods and among them there are about 15000 species of arthropods in more than 400 genera i have blood feeding habit it's a huge number okay and this hematophagous trait has independently evolved at least 20 times so that means 20 times in the geological times independently this blood feeding habits have come in so that means they have to choose different protein scaffolds different strategies of developing anticoagulation antiplatelet effect and vasodilation and the immune suppression so you can imagine there is an enormous pool of structurally and functionally diverse uh, proteins which you can study okay but so far we have studied less than 40 species we have studied less than 50 to 100 proteins i would say in detail even smaller number okay it's a very small number of proteins we have captured so there is a tremendous wealth out there for you to study so if you look at the anticoagulants so this is the coagulation cascade and uh, these are the spots where the tick uh, anticoagulants block it and today we are going to focus only on the thrombin thrombin inhibitors and there are several thrombin inhibitors purified and just to give you an idea the molecular diversity of thrombin inhibitors so you can see each of them are very very structurally different so this is iridin family this is a snack like family lectin c type lectin family 
Kunish type inhibitor, Kasal type inhibitor, Lipokalin family, Antistasin family. These are not the only structural diversity. So there are more than uh, nine other families of thrombin inhibitors. You can imagine there are probably about 15, 20 families of thrombin inhibitors whose structures are very, very different. So you can imagine how uh, nature has tackled this problem of just inhibiting thrombin. Okay? So just to give you an idea of mechanism of inhibition, this is both hiridin and hemidin are two proteins isolated from leech. They belong to the same structural family. The minor difference is there is a twist here in the end, so that's why one the tail goes this way, one tail comes to the front end. But their ability to inhibit thrombin is very different. Their mechanism is both of them bind to the active site, but one binds to the exercise one, one binds to exercise two. So even the mechanism by which they inhibit will be very different. Okay? And if you look at the uh, mechanism of inhibition of various different molecules like arnithodorin, which is a Kunitz uh, inhibitor, and rodnin, which is a Kazal inhibitor, and lipocalin, which is a uh, different molecule, different uh, set of molecule triabin, and they all bind to exercise one and block the, uh, block the thrombin. So in spite of having different structures, it recognizes same exercise one. So I just wanted to just understand how, how diverse these groups can be, both in terms of structure, their function, their mechanism, their targeting different sites. So it provides a great opportunity to study various things. So with this background, we isolated a new class, completely new class, not those 15 I showed you about. Another class of protein, uh, we called it Verigen. It's a novel, fast and tight binding thrombin inhibitor isolated from Bontech. Okay? So Bontech, they feed on uh, uh, domesticated animals including cattle, sheep, goats, and even humans. Okay? But they leave very big uh, wounds, large wounds. It's very difficult to remove them manually because they put their mouth in and cement it in the wound. So when you pull it, it's not so easy. Okay? <laughs> and uh, they're, they're also host of a number of pathogens. So when you study hematophagous animals, you also get to study parasites and pathogens, vector bone diseases and things like that. Quite interesting. So these are endemic to tropics and subtropics and it comes from sub-Saharan sub Africa. Okay? So I want you to remember the story I'm going to tell you is really a global story. So tick comes from sub-Saharan Africa and this was all grown in uh, one of my collaborators' lab in Czech Republic, in Europe, okay? So you can see the unfit female is like that, and when it's fully engaged, it becomes very big, okay? <laughs> okay, and uh, you can also see the salivary gland, so it becomes, becomes from this side to this size. It, really becomes very big, okay? From this salivary gland, uh, they isolated, uh, Maria isolated these compounds, so she isolated these uh, molecules by uh, reverse phase HPLC and screening and uh, finding the bioactive molecules. And these are the sequences of these molecules. They're closely related, but there's nothing like that in the literature. So there was nothing in the database. But only thing we could identify was this small piece of the sequence is similar to hirudin, leech thrombin inhibitor's tail. Okay? And what we did is, in our lab we can synthesize the molecule. So we made 
uh, looked at the native version. Of course, this is the full length 32 amino acid residue thing. And it has uh, hexose attached to the threonine there. It's a O glycosylated molecule. And it has a IC50 of 0.99 uh, nanomolar. You can take it as one. And uh, KA of 10.4 picomolar. It's quite uh, potent. And we synthetically made this peptide without the hexos because we didn't know what the hexos was. So we made synthetic version and we also made two other peptides leaving out the first seven and the next seven. So we made it shorter, truncated versions of it and checked for its biological activity. So the full length uh, version has uh, IC50 of 5 nanomolar, about 5 times weaker, okay? And when you look at the KI, it's about 146, about 15 times weaker affinity compared to the uh, native protein. So it's a competitive inhibitor. It's a fast tight binding inhibitor. We say this because whether you do it in, without any incubation or after 10 minutes incubation, the IC50 does not change a lot, okay? And uh, compared to native, it's slightly weaker, okay? And then let's look at EP25, which is seven residues removed from the end terminal. So if you change the uh, time, you can see zero minute is here and 20 minute is here. So as you incubate longer time, it moves, the IC50 changes quite drastically, okay? So it tells us that uh, uh, it's a slow tight binding inhibitor. We you have to use a different kinetics parameters. So we use that uh, equation and the Ki is 149, which is almost the same as the native, uh, uh, synthetic one, okay? And if you compare, EP25 with Verigen. You can see Verigen is like that. It would bind to both. And if you remove the N-terminal 7 residue piece, so its ability to bind slows down. So that is responsible for making it from fast binding to slow binding. Okay? And if you remove additional 7 residues, so now it's 14 residues removed, and now this peptide doesn't inhibit any more thrombin activity, but it increases the amidolytic activity slightly, about 10%. Okay? So this is a characteristic of things which bind to exercise 1. <coughs> when something binds to exercise 1, thrombin activity goes up slightly. Okay? And if you look at fibrin clotting time, so this is the synthetic version. EP25 and uh, AP18. So you can see all the three inhibit fibrin clotting time. So that means fibrinogen does bind to exercise one. So that's where the competition is. But all the peptides block it, but not the uh, uh, amyloidic activity. So just to summarize, so e, e, uh, S, uh, oh sorry, it has moved a little bit. So S version, it inhibits both amyloidic activity and uh, fibrinogen activity, fibrinogen clotting. And EP25 uh, uh, blocks also both, but AP25 does not block the amyloidic activity, but blocks the fibrin clotting, okay? And now let's look at what is the selectivity. You remember we need something which is highly specific. Yeah? So if you look at the uh, thrombin, so I want you to look at this uh, pink colored bar, which is 10 nanomolar. So at 10 nanomolar, it blocks 60% activity. As you increase the concentration, of course, it reaches 90 plus percent inhibition. But all the other serine proteases, there are 12 others, and we have looked all the way to 100 micromolar blue bar. So if you look at all of this at 100 micromolar, it still doesn't reach 40% inhibition. So it tells us it is at least 
ten thousand times selective. So it does not touch any other serine protease except thrombin. So it's highly selective molecule, highly specific inhibitor of thrombin. Okay? So now if you look at the classes of thrombin inhibitors, I showed you the crystal structure and the NMR structures of these molecules. And I've written thrombin as a cartoon form, how they would bind. So you can see they are very different structures and slightly different mechanisms. Yeah? But if you look at our molecule, is way small compared to any, but it has very high affinity to bind to thrombin. Because it binds to the active site, it could be cleaved, so we tested whether it gets cleaved. So this is HPLC profile showing that's at zero minute in the top. And here, after a couple of minutes, you see there is cleavage, and with more time, you see completely cleaved. Okay? So, by the mass uh, of this molecule peptide, we identified exactly where the cleavage occurs. Okay? And now we have plotted all of these. The red colored bars are the full length version, blue colored bars are the C terminal end of it and uh, the yellow colored uh, bars are the N-terminal part of this molecule. So we looked at all of these and quantified them and as you can see by the time you reach about 6 hours only about 15 percent, 18 percent of the full length molecule is there. Okay? And we checked the activity of these mixtures. So interestingly at 360 minutes you can see there is almost nothing has come down. The activity is still there. Okay? And even at 24 hours, it's still just about 60% activity is still remaining. So this tells us there is a prolonged inhibitory effect. So that also indicates cleavage product is still active. So we synthesize the peptide of the C-terminal. We call it MH22 and this peptide inhibits, okay? And if you look at the synthetic version and MH22, the dose response is almost similar, almost. Not identical, but similar. But if you look at the uh, inhibition, Kirillag is competitive inhibitor, so as you increase the substrate concentration, you can remove the inhibition. Whereas of MH22, it's non-competitive. So it binds, but it is not uh, competing with the substrate. So it allows it to continue to inhibit. So now, just to summarize, so we have created a lot of different molecules, which has uh, Ki in sub-nanomolar. So it's bivalent, fast, tight binding, and competitive inhibitor. And EP25 is bivalent, slow tight binding competitive inhibitor, whereas AP18 is univalent but fast binding, uh, but MH22 is bivalent, fast and tight binding, but non-competitive inhibitor. Okay? So by looking at this, you can say this first seven residues are responsible for fast and tight binding kinetics, and these three residues are important for competitive and non-competitive binding. Okay, so we added back the three residues and made the uh, studies to show it indeed increases the fast binding. Subsequently, we have completed the crystal structure of thrombin and the, uh, the uh, virgin. So it binds so snugly into the molecule. So density of the cleavage product of virgin C terminus is, can be traced. The internal piece is not there in the uh, uh, crystal structure. So peptide fits very well into the catalytic pocket it, uh, and subsi uh, prime subsides and binds to exocyte 1 quite well. Okay? And you can also understand why it is a non-competitive uh, inhibitor because it goes and binds there so that it does not actually bind to the active site binding pocket but only the prime subsides. 
Okay. So just to give you little more closer details of the structure, the green one is the native thrombin. You can see the aspartate, histidine, and uh, serine. So they have uh, hydrogen bonding distances between them, whereas the minute you put the uh, verigin, it pulls the serine away and that alters the structure of histidine and now it's 3.77 that means it breaks the hydrogen bonding uh, interaction so the charge relay system of this serine protease is disturbed by this so it's a unique mechanism by which verigin inhibits the thrombin we have removed this histidine and replaced with alanine you lose about tenfold activity Okay, so if you look at the exocyte, it interacts with all these uh, important surface loops of thrombin, and if you look at the prime subsides, it interacts very closely with all the prime subsides. So each of them are color coded quite well, and this is the first thrombin inhibitor that interacts with the prime subsides. Because of this, it stays bound to the uh, thrombin even after cleavage, okay? So if you look at the crystal structure very closely, what we would find is, sorry, what we would find is all these white residues are not in touch with thrombin. They're not interacting. We said, can we make them go close and bind to it? To do that, we removed this uh, kink uh, there are two prolines next to each other, so we removed one of them to see what it does. And we replaced this alanine with uh, uh, glutamic acid, which would form an uh, iron pair uh, with arginine of thrombin. And we uh, kind of sulfated this tyrosine, which is uh, sulfated in uh, hirudin. So basically, we found we removed these uh, four residues which are not necessary in the interaction uh, because you see in the thrombin crystal structure these four residues are not seen in contact with thrombin. We removed the first seven residues. As you remember, it became slow binding inhibitor. So we added back the three residues so that it becomes fast binding again. Okay, And then we made several changes. Uh, to improve the activity and let's see what happens. So if you remember these two, so EP25 and Virgin, they are fast and slow binding but the affinities are similar and MH22 has the uh, affinity slightly lower. And what we have done is removed the four residues from the C-terminal end, affinity doesn't change. Okay, And then we have added instead of uh, lysine, we have uh, added, uh, sorry, in the, instead of this uh, EP25, we have added few more residues in the front end and removed this uh, um, uh, C-terminal tail. Affinity remains the same and it becomes fast binding and we have removed one of the prolines and when you do that, affinity drops a little bit, okay? So we kept the proline and now we uh, inserted uh, glutamic acid uh, and when, when alanine is replaced with glutamic acid, there is slight increase in activity but not significant. And uh, when we took out the uh, lysine to arginine, made it arginine, it doesn't change much in the DV24 but in DV23, where the proline is re removed, it has significant effect. And when we did uh, uh, phosphorylation, activity doesn't change much, but when you do sulfation, activity increases quite significantly. Okay? So just to, for comparison, all of these key ones, I put them together. You can see now affinity is 0.42, is 42 picomolar. Okay? It's quite low, and uh, even MH18Y sulfated uh, thing has one nanomolar affinity. It's quite good in terms of function. Just to give you an idea, 
how it compares with uh, Hirulag, which is in the market. So you can see it's at least 70 times more potent. So in Hirudin Hirulag story, from 65 residues, they have shut, uh, made it into 20 residues, and the affinity uh, is dropped a little bit from 20 to 200 femtomolar to uh, 2.3 nanomolar. Whereas plasma half-life from 120 minutes, it has come down to 25 minutes and uh, it is uh, renal and uh, removal excretion is through renal and hepatic uh, roots. But if you look at uh, virgin, what we have done from synthetic virgin, we have from 32 residues, we have cut, it to, cut down to 24 and from 340 uh, picomolar affinity, we have gone to 42 picomolar. Actually, we have increased the affinity. And uh, from 48 minutes, and we have not tested this, and we know it's definitely renal. We don't know whether it's hepatic. And uh, heart one, we don't know. In this case, they have lost about 10,000 fold activity by cutting. We increased the affinity by 7.5 fold. Okay? <coughs> These molecules, we tested them in zebrafish venous uh, thrombosis model. Unfortunately, video is not working, so you have to take my word for it. So the red arrow shows the blood flow to the top, and the blue arrow comes down. On the top of the red arrow, we hit it with laser, and when you do that, the blood will start uh, uh, clotting because of the injury. <coughs> After some time, the, uh, it will start blocking the whole thing. So that is considered as time for occlusion, TTO. Okay? So when you do this experiment, you'll see with phosphate buffered saline, it takes about 20 seconds to clot, block it. Whereas with Hirulag, about uh, you know, 5 nanomole per larva injection. So it doubles the time. Whereas with uh, synthetic virgin, it almost uh, six times increase in the clotting time or blocking time, TTO, whereas EP25 is almost useless and uh, MH22 just about as good as Hirulog, but this is the heart mutant, it doesn't even clot, okay? This gave us confidence that we could go and do further studies. So, what we did was we did efficacy studies and side effects profile in uh, rats, rat carotid artery thrombosis model. As you can see, we have exposed the uh, carotid artery here, and the blue one is the Doppler uh, probe, which measures the blood flow. And in front of the Doppler flow, uh, flow probe, you put a ferric chloride soap filter paper, so it injures the blood vessel, so blood starts clotting, okay? So you measure the blood flow in the Doppler, so that's where you put the ferric chloride filter paper, so you can see the blood flow is there, and after some time it clots and there is no more, no more blood flow. It's called time for occlusion uh, TTO, and drugs are uh, administered through femoral vein cannula. When there is drug, the clotting time, TTO becomes longer. Okay, that's what we are measuring. And for safety, we looked at tail incision model. This is a rat tail, although it looks like a triangle, but it's a rat tail. So we put a, a, a surgical blade to chop it a little bit, and uh, you use the filter paper to dab it. So not on the wound, but on the surrounding to see whether the blood is oozing out. And you measure the bleeding time. When the bleeding stops, you stop it. You know how much it is. So if it is very strong anticoagulant, bleeding will not stop. Okay? So in this model, we looked for the safety and efficacy. Okay? So if you look at uh, uh, efficacy model, the blue dots are all efficacy data and red dots are all safety data. Okay, so as you increase unfractionated heparin, so the uh, antithrombotic potential increases, there is less and less 
uh, platform so that means uh, it takes longer time for the uh, for TTO similarly the bleeding time also keeps increasing so if you look at the two curves there is not much of space between the two but hirulog which is in the market there is little bit space between the two and with our molecule there is lot more space between the two so the window is quite bigger okay so this told us that it's a very good mo molecule so we went to the large animal model so this is done in pig so in the pig what we do is we from carotid artery we take the uh, ex uh, extra corporeal circulation so we make the circulation for it and there are three perfusion chambers in each of these perfusion chamber we put the stent in the middle and top of it we put endothelium denuded aorta this will make it a very pro thrombotic situation and we circulate the blood and of course we treat the pig with either saline or the drug molecule okay and see what it does so in the top we have infused only anticoagulant the first one is saline in saline of course the blood clots within about 30 to 40 minutes 45 minutes there is no more flow because it stops flow completely you can't measure anymore but you can still see this tube is filled with uh, thrombus okay if you look at 1 mg per kg virgin you can see the stent is quite clean okay compared to 100 units per kg of heparin or uh, the hirulog hirulog we in in the patients you don't just inject in single bolus you inject a bolus followed by infusion so that's why there are two things so this is for you inject 0.75 mg per kg followed by 1.75 mg per kg per hour you flow okay so it's a continuous infusion because its half life is very short so you allow it to keep feeding it okay so in spite of that these two have little bit but it's definitely way better than this saline but it's not uh, virgin is way better than both of these okay but in reality you remember i told you in pci we use antiplatelet therapy so we call it dual antiplatelet therapy so because there are two agents which do block the uh, antiplatelet function so that's the dapt along with the anticoagulant the minute you put dapt you can see that saline which is completely blocked is quite clear not perfect but quite clear and now of course uh, heparin and uh, hirulog also looks quite nice not bad but look at 0.1 mg per kg this is from 1 mg we have come down to 1 mg 0.1 mg 10 times lower it's almost like stent is just taken out of the uh, bag it's quite clean very clean okay so this is kind of tabulated in this figure so uh, when you have saline with or with anticoagulant alone it forms 80 mg of clot and that is reduced by about 75 80% with uh, virgin and uh, ultra uh, heparin and hirulog about 40% and 60% but if you look at the bleeding time we have done year bleeding time for in the pigs in the same pig so you can see the bleeding time is almost comparable with comparable bleeding time virgin shows much better anti thrombotic effect with dapt you can see it is still better with dapt from 80 mg it has come down to 10 mg 10 11 mg so which is quite good but even in that condition it drops by 80% okay and uh, it's still better than heparin and hirulog but 
it's very interesting to look at the bleeding time. It does not change the bleeding time from DAPT to DAPT with version. It's almost the same level of uh, bleeding, so that means it doesn't bleed at all. Whereas these two have already gone way high, about 10 times the bleeding time. So we think it's very good molecule. So we have competitive advantage and we have the IP uh, set up for it and currently we are looking to go into preclinical admitox studies. Okay. So currently we have finished this part of it somewhere uh, in the blue segment there. Okay. And we are looking for more money to go into this next level of uh, studies. Okay. So we are not the only ones who have done these kind of things. Uh, I, di I did talk about only the uh, tick uh, work, but most of my work is on snake venoms. We have also other molecules isolated from snake venom in different uh, stages. We have some of them we have completed monkey studies and things. It's already uh, quite good. And we are going into for heart failure model into sheep starting July. Okay. But this is just to give you an idea, there are many other drugs from Cistrus, people have developed eptifibatide uh, based on a protein called barburin, and uh, this is in the market. This is also an antiplatelet drug for the PCI, and uh, similarly from echistatin, uh, people have isolated a protein called tirofiban, uh, sorry, made a molecule called tirofiban. So this should have been echistatin here, so it's uh, mislabeled. Okay, so once you complete all this study, you need to do preclinical admit act study. Okay, this is where we are heading. So admit study stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. Okay, this is done to understand dose range studies to find out how much dose can you go. This is done in two different species of animals and it's done as a chronic uh, administration. So it means every day you inject, okay? And you also do recovery stage. Once you stop it, does it have any problem with, to the animal, okay? So in preclinical toxicology, you look at pharmacokinetics, uh, systemic exposure, trying to understand what it does, and uh, pharmacodynamics, trying to understand the threshold you can put, because you want to know what's the maximum it can uh, take it, tolerate. So you understand the window, uh, therapeutic window. And in this study, you also do hematology and blood chemistry to understand what goes on in the blood. And in the end of the experiment, you do histology and histochemistry of all the vital organs to see whether there is any problem, whether there is any issue we need to pay attention to. And of course, throughout the experiment, we look at the behavior of the animal. So you see what it does, how it does, does it affect its memory, does it affect its some function or the other. So this is done in track research organization. So these are FDA approved or CFDA approved or SFDA approved or whatever, whatever approved. Okay. And uh, all of them are done under GMP protocol. So therefore, it's always done not in a lab level, but in a contract research organization level. In phase one, we are looking for the safety. So we look for healthy volunteers to see what we do. And this is also a dose range finding. So in the animal, we try to go to find the dose range till it exhibits toxicity because we want to understand what is the toxic uh, effect this drug would do, okay? But um, in, in humans, you are not going to go till the toxicity. What we do is we take from the efficacy, we go probably 10% of the efficacy dose, then 50% of the efficacy dose, and probably, uh, you know, efficacy dose, and a little bit higher than the efficacy dose. The toxicity 
things what you have observed in the animals we keep seeing for those symptoms in humans does he or she develop you know healthy volunteers develop these psychic symptoms if we see that's the end of the message for the drug because it's not safe at all okay so you also do hematology and blood chemistry you also look at the behavior of the healthy individuals and look for the adverse effects so this is these are the toxicity efforts uh, effects you you had observed in the animal you look for them carefully okay so in phase 2 you do efficacy and safety studies so this is done in patients so you select a small group of patients 50 to 100 and you do sometimes double blind placebo control randomized double blind is patient doesn't know doctor doesn't know okay and uh, placebo control is some will get the drug others won't get the drug but this is unfair because the uh, drug is already there in the market so in such a case what we do is in the instead of placebo you use it against a comparator drug okay you give them the drug but you don't know which one is the uh, drug which is experimental drug which one is the drug in the market they won't know both the patient and the doctor won't know and it's done in a randomized fashion so nobody would know who is getting what okay and you do the comparative drug as i told you and you also look for the hematology behavior and adverse effects and you see uh, whether it's efficacious drug compared to the one in the market if it is a new drug you don't have any comparison but you want to make sure that it does solve the problem okay so this depends on the end point selection end point selection is very critical clinicians really have to be very careful in selecting the end point if the end points are poorly selected phase 2 will fail once phase 2 fails it's very hard for the companies to recover especially if they are very small okay so sometimes you can also do phase 1b studies where in healthy volunteers you see what the pharmacodynamics is you can also measure what happens okay in phase 3 it's still efficacy and safety but now you are dealing with larger patient larger number of patients and it's also double blind placebo control randomized trial and you have a comparative drug you use it and you follow all of these to do it and once you complete all of this there is uh, in the investigational new drug application and uh, fda will look at this and uh, see okay you can go ahead and release it in the public and uh, drug will be entering respective molecules the re- respective market so just because it's approved by the us doesn't mean we can sell it in indonesia indonesian agency has to approve it okay so like that same if it is tested in indonesia doesn't mean it's okay to sell it in the, in the us either so each of these places it has to be approved and after some time in the market the clinicians use drugs off label off label is they know it's an anticoagulant they would use it for all anticoagulant requirement although it has not been tested for specific applications so these things happen quite common so for example the painkiller will be used for headache to stomach ache to back ache to knee joint pain sprain etc okay so simplistic path to drug development i kind of explained to you so there are several go no go points so when it fails it fails so there is no emotional attachment to your molecule you just have to let go okay so there is excitement of commercialization so how to start this business so three key requirement you need an idea so it's always good to have you need money 
and you need personnel. So personnel is not any personnel. You want them to be really competent personnel, not because he's a very good friend of mine doesn't make it good. Okay. <laughs> idea. So idea can be protected differently. One of them is keeping it as a trade secret. Okay. Trade secret, the best example is Coca-Cola. So it's been there for 50 plus years and nobody knows what the hell is it. <laughs> it dissolves stone. <laughs> but we drink it anyway. So then you have what is called specific know-how. So you have only a small group of people, they know what it is, how to do it, and it is not transferable that easily. So that's how you protect it. Uh, and of course, patent protection. This is intellectual property. You can imagine intellectual property has only 20 years lifetime. But copyright, you write anything on something, it has more than 50 years protection. Okay. And uh, trade secret, you cannot break it. It <laughs> remains forever. So sometimes it's very tricky. So patenting and public disclosure. So patenting is re uh, related to public, public disclosure. So because we have filed all the patents, that's why I'm talking some parts of it. The others I didn't talk uh, because of the uh, patent protection. Okay? Once you disclose, you cannot patent it. You cannot file for a patent. Okay? Only few countries, uh, for example, US allows you one year time to file for the patent after the public disclosure. Okay? Public disclosure can be just a meeting with 10 people or even 5 people. It's gone. Okay? So, uh, if it's your internal group, it's okay. But just anybody outside is dead. Okay? And of course, you have patent filing. So, I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty details of it. Uh, there are a lot of claims. And uh, then there is PCT countries. So, that means once you file for the patent, within 18 months, you can go to national stage uh, filing. So, you can choose what are all the countries where you want it to be protected. So, you all file separately to various uh, countries, PCT countries. So, there is a difference between an inventor and an author. Okay? Author in the same paper need not be an inventor. Inventor is a person who has actually contributed to the intellectual property, innovation. Just because you have done the experiment that does not give you the place in the uh, patent inventor list. Okay? So you have to be very careful. If just because of your, your kindness you include somebody or your respect to the dean or the chair or somebody you put them in, it will be challenged in the court of law. And if it doesn't hold good, it's dead. You can forget it. Okay? No matter how far it has gone, they will investigate if there is a need for it. So, idea. It's, it can be in diagnostics. So, developing this is quite easy, fast. And uh, devices, it's also quite fast and cheaper to do. Diagnostic is the cheapest one to do. For example, PCR-based diagnostics are some measuring something in the blood. And these are quite easy to do. And uh, uh, all you have to do is produce a kit. Okay? And there's a company which is going willing to take this to the market. Okay? Especially ex vivo things, there's almost very little hurdle to go back. Devices, of course, you need to make a prototype and show that it's useful. So it does not cost a lot of money, but it does cost some. And drugs, I told you it costs a lot of money. And I told you what the paths are. So ideas can be platform ideas. That means from one idea, you can generate multiple stories. 
multiple uh, drugs, multiple devices, multiple things you can do. Okay? Product is also very important because you may have a platform, but you don't have the proof of concept. So that means you don't have direct evidence that your platform can create a product. So you need to have a product. And of course, you need to have a pipeline. <coughs> you cannot have a single single uh, uh, molecule, sing, single product. Because, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is just a few things to do, and without that it dies. Because if you have one product, if it fails, it's gone. So licensing is also done to companies and VCs, and that it, you need to have freedom to operate in that uh, region to get there, and there's terms of use. Okay. And there is equity and royalties, all of these are kind of very important and there are milestones and penalties when the licensee collects it. Okay. So there is business plan you need to develop to raise money to find out how should the investor should get the money and what are the goals and what are the exit strategies for the VC. So money is also important as I told you. You can use personal funds, but some of us are not that rich. And you can also get it from angel investors, venture capitalists, and large companies. So like that, you can also get, they will all do due diligence, equity versus revenue stream uh, uh, variations are there. Exit plan and outcome is important. Personnel, as I told you, you need all of them with uh, suitable uh, capability. So for each of these, there is certain requirement to go and uh, do things. So with this, I close my talk. This is the actually the sunrise I was telling you about. This is the picture of your sunrise last year. <laughs> this happens every day. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.